Hi, this is a special report on the deficits, the debt, uh, this crisis, and how it's all going to affect your life. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff in this report, some bad news. However, it's much better to know what's coming at you and get prepared, whether it be good or bad, uh, than to be taken by surprise. Knowing what's coming at you will give you a little bit of an edge and increase your likelihood of, of surviving what is about to happen and come out uh, fairly well on the other side of it. Uh, we're going through something incredibly historic right now, and as you're going to see, we might be witnessing the end of this fiat currency system. Uh, there, there, there's a, a corner that they've painted themselves into. We're boxed in. Uh, you know, if we had some national savings, but we didn't, we dug ourselves into a pit of debt. If the markets weren't in bubbles, the stock market, the real estate, if they weren't in extreme bubbles, uh, debt, the, the bond bubble, all of it, if it wasn't in, if in, in extreme bubbles while we were sitting in this giant pit of debt, then maybe we'd have a chance of coming out of this. But once I present all of this data to you, I want you to sort of Add this all up in your mind and see if you can think of any way that you could possibly uh, get out of, you know, get yourself out of what, if, if you were the government, if you were the central bank, if you were the treasury, is there any way that you can get out of the corner that you have painted yourself into, the trap that you've gotten yourself in? So I'm going to get right into it here. Uh, this is the story where I, I stopped and said, this is just too big to cover in one of my regular presentations. So I was going to make a presentation wrapped entirely around this subject. U.S. Treasury seeks to borrow a record $3 trillion this quarter. This quarter. So <laughs> this is something that we have to remember as I'm going through this whole thing. I want to start with the national debt clock, which I covered just a little while ago, I think last weekend. Uh, but we're about to top $25 trillion in national debt already. And this doesn't have that $3 trillion that they're going to borrow and the $2 trillion that, the, that uh, you know, the stimulus package that they just passed. But the things I do want to point out is if you notice this, it's gaining $100,000. It's increasing $200,000. $300,000 about every five seconds. And then over here, about every 15 seconds, the tax revenues are falling by $100,000 about every 15 seconds. The total uh, debt per U.S. citizen is $75,000, but not all of us work. This includes children and retirees. So per taxpayer, each taxpayer owes $200,000 in national debt. <clears throat> The uh, official federal spending, which they calculate as the total amount of dollars appropriated and spent by the U.S. Congress and approved by the president. And then uh, the U.S. federal budget deficit, which is uh, the official deficit, and they calculate that as the difference between the total amount spent by Congress and the revenue received by the Internal Revenue Service. But then under here, they've got the actual the U.S. federal spending actual, and there, you know, this is 6.1 trillion. This is 6.7 trillion. Uh, the deficit, the official, is 2.6 trillion. The actual is 3.192, so 3.2 trillion. So huge differences here. Uh, the, the, you know, this just goes on and on and on, and you really should take a look for yourself. Put your cursor over any one of these and you'll see that the area up at the top uh, has a definition, a description of how it's calculated. Uh, but then you go down here uh, to unfunded liabilities uh, or you know, unfunded debt slash interest and uh, total interest paid. Uh, the total U.S. debt includes uh, state, local, and household debt, and that's at $77 trillion that we owe as a society, uh, you know, you have to ask, to whom do we owe? <laughs> because somebody has to loan you that, so somebody must have it to loan it. But, you know, the, the net here is that we owe $77 trillion, And that most, most of this is made up out of thin air. So, uh, you know, it's, 
It's made up. It's uh, part of it. So bank bank interest received, bank interest paid, uh, total personal debt, twenty trillion dollars, uh, student loans, credit card debt of of one point one trillion, currency creation. The M2 currency supply, and you can see this going up by $100,000 about every three or four seconds. Currency and credit derivatives. This is 100,000 million billion trillion. 678 trillion in currency and credit derivatives now. And uh, back in the year 2000, that was at 90 trillion. So this century, we've gone from 90 trillion to 678 trillion. These are just totally insane figures. Uh, U.S. uh, debt held by foreign countries is 7.2 trillion. That's a good one to remember as we go through this. Uh, The trade deficits with China and so on. Uh, Household assets. One thing about household assets, notice that this number is going backwards. uh, By, you know, it's going backwards by a million dollars every, let me see, one, two, th- about every three seconds. Household assets is going backwards by about a million dollars every three seconds. U.S. total national assets, uh, one, two, one, two, three, about every three seconds, that's going backwards by about a million dollars every three seconds. Uh, Social Security liabilities, the, the liabilities are all increasing. So there's a hundred thousand, and here's another hundred thousand, and here's another hundred thousand. Uh, Medicare unfunded liabilities, a hundred and forty-seven trillion dollars worth of unfunded liabilities, liabilities that the budget does not take into account that we don't know how we're going to pay for. We promised all of these things, but we never created a method of collecting taxes or some sort of revenue to be able to pay for these promises that the government has created. A few interesting things uh, to point out here is they've got uh, the paper to silver ratio. And this is calculated, they've got a paper to gold ratio, paper to crypto, paper to gold, paper to silver. Paper to gold ratio, that's calculated by the number of uh, paper gold ounces traded on the world's major exchanges divided by the actual world production of gold in ounces per year. So the amount of gold that's uh, for every ounce of gold that is coming uh, into the, you know, that's that's being produced each year, there's 88 ounces of gold being traded. And with silver, it's 174 ounces being traded to each ounce. This is like a game of musical chairs. There's 174 people dancing. There's one seat. What happens when the music stops? It's going to create some fireworks. Uh, The number of dollars to gold, that's a year-over-year increase. So the amount of dollars that they add to the M2 currency supply divided by the yearly increase in gold production. So there's $21,000 per ounce Uh, per ounce of gold that comes into existence, there's $21,000 that comes into existence each year. So uh, back in in, in 1913, it was $29 per ounce. And gold was $20.67 per ounce, so it was close. Here it's showing you the spread. Uh, Dollars to silver ratio, uh, $2,500 per ounce. This is interesting, $2,500 per ounce, $21,000 per ounce. Uh, this is uh, le- this is a, more than a 10 to 1 ratio between gold and silver, suggesting some very, very high prices of silver in the future. But this is a fascinating thing to look at. Everybody should just look at this and sort of get a bearing on what's happening. Uh, now, I'm going to take you to the uh, fiscal year 2020 budget of the United States government. And you can, you can download this. Uh, I'm going to take you to page, this is page 139 of the report. And here you have uh, the held by, uh, the debt held by government accounts and the debt held by the public. Now this is different than uh, the public debt. This is debt held by the public. So it's the other side of the debt. 
Uh, the debt is the amount that we owe on the treasury bonds that they've issued. Uh, these are the treasury bonds held by the public. And if you look at number six, there's this little footnote six here. You go there and it says, at the end of 2018, the Federal Reserve Banks held $2.3 trillion of federal securities and the rest of the public, the rest of the public, so the Federal Reserve is part of the public, the rest of the public held uh, $13.4 trillion. So you add those two together and you get this figure uh, right, that was the end of 2018, so you'd get this figure right here. Um, and so it's made up of these, so uh, what is held by the public, and what, but remember, there's a large portion of that held by foreign governments. This is not all held by the U.S. Uh, citizens. So seven-something trillion is held by foreign governments. Uh, this is being held by the Federal Reserve. You add it all up, and this is the total. But that is not the national debt. Uh, there is also debt held by government accounts, and this is something called intergovernmental transfers. And those intergovernmental transfers, when you add this, Plus this, you get the, na the national debt. These intergovernmental transfers, th this is the type of treasury bond that you and I can buy and the Federal Reserve buys and foreign governments buy. But there's a special tre treasury bond that they issue. And a treasury bond is just an IOU. Remember, it's an IOU and they borrow currency. And they create these special treasury bonds. Uh, you know, 2019, it was supposed to be 5.87 trillion and 2020 it's supposed to be about six trillion dollars of intergovernmental transfers so they uh, create these special IOUs uh, and they put them in they, they take currency that's in some sort of fund in the government that has a surplus such as the Social Security Trust Fund now that trust fund you and I pay tax Social Security taxes on your income you see that as one of the line items of tax that you pay on your income, uh, that goes into the Social Security Trust Fund. Trust Fund is supposed to be like a savings account for all of us. The Treasury creates a special bond, an IOU, sticks it in there and takes the cash and adds the cash to the general fund and spends it. <laughs> now, what's interesting is you would think that the Treasury uh, owes us that, uh, owes that back to us, the public. They took the currency from us and put it in this savings account then they borrowed it and spent it, so you'd think that they owe it back. But when you go to the national debt, uh, when you go to the national debt, this is federal debt, total public debt. Remember, the other one was uh, debt held by the public. This is federal debt, total public debt. I find this interesting. I wish they could make up their minds. Is it federal debt or is it total public debt? Oh. It's federal debt in that the government, the federal, they, they get to spend it, but it, we, the public, are on the hook for paying it back. And the total of this comes to $23.2 trillion. Uh, now, that's what we have to pay back by uh, making the tax payments to pay back these treasury bonds. <laughs> and so the treasury bonds that they, the treasury bonds that they, uh, took from our, that they issued when they took our savings accounts in the total Social Security Trust Funds are incorporated in this. So we have to pay taxes to pay ourselves back for the currency the Treasury took and spent on our behalf out of, out of our savings account that they took from us in taxes in the first place. It's totally insane. Uh, just stick with me here. This is going longer than I thought. It'll take a little while, but it's highly entertaining. Now, uh, this is as of Q4 of 2019, so it's as of the end of last year. Now, uh, the U.S. government has a fiscal year of uh, September 30th, uh, so Q4 of 2019 would end uh, September 30th of 2019. Uh, this is the debt held by the uh, public, uh, federal debt held by the public, and that's now at $17 trillion but it includes that 7.1 held by foreign uh, entities, and it includes what the Federal Reserve holds. So there's 17 trillion held by the public. The other five something trillion or six trillion is held uh, in the uh, 
government agencies, the accounts where they had a surplus and the treasury borrowed that and added it to the general fund and spent it. Uh, so moving on, in the, another table on page 107 of the budget of the United States, you see what the budget is, and they've, they've made projections, extrapolating it out, showing how they're going to pay down the debt, because uh, the debt held by the public uh, as a percentage of GDP is supposed to be falling and falling. You know, it's going to go up a little. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. Every administration does this. It doesn't matter whether it's Democratic or Republican. Uh, it's going to go up during their administration. But then the next guy is going to pay it down. <laughs> That's always the way that they calculate these things. If you see the receipts and the outlays, the outlays as a percentage of GDP are uh, high now, and then they're going to go down in the future, and the revenues are going to increase in the future. This is always the projections. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's Democrat or Republicans in office, but what you see here is that they say that our receipts in 2019 were 3.4 trillion and, and expenditures were 4.5. And uh, they say that our deficit was uh, 1.09, you know, it's 1 trillion 92 billion. Uh, in 2020, it's supposed to be, we're supposed to take in 3.645 trillion, spend uh, 4.746 trillion. And that's going to mean that we will have a day. They planned, this was part of their budget. They planned on spending $1.1 trillion more than their income. That was the plan. Now we're going to go to um, the deficit. Remember that they said that in 2019, this is 2019, annual fiscal year end. Uh, so that ends September 30, 2019. They said that in 2019 it was going the, that the deficit was uh, 1 trillion 92 billion. The Federal Reserve says that the deficit was 984 billion. And so there's something missing there. Uh, I could do the math, but I don't want to do the math right now because there's some math that I'm going to do later. This one is less consequential. Now, if you take uh, the uh, federal receipts, so this is our income, federal receipts. I'm going to um, copy this as a shortcut because it'll give me the right. Well, no, I'll copy this just so you can see the lists that come up. Um, federal receipts, copy that. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, the, so the federal receipts uh, in 2019, uh, $3,464,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
1.64 billion minus uh, the 1.64 federal government expenditures, and I'm going to go to the final quarter of last year, of $4,873 billion. Uh, $4,873 billion. And you end up with a deficit. They spent $1,409 billion more than their income. So the, <laughs> if you take the income minus what you spent, uh, we went in the hole by one trillion four hundred nine billion, but when you look at the deficit, that was nine hundred eighty four billion. So there's sort of big discrepancy here. And then when you go over to uh, the uh, the the budget of the United States, it says it was uh, one trillion ninety two billion. I wish that they could make up their minds. But here's what's interesting, uh, and the reason for this whole report here is if you take the expenditures, and so uh, and then you hit this edit graph button, and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to add a data set, and the data set that I'm going to add is the federal receipts, and we're not looking for tax receipts, we're looking for the one that just says federal receipts, because this includes all uh, duties and uh, uh, other fees and stuff that the government collects. And it goes back to 1901. This is a great data set. So federal receipts, we're going to select that, and we're going to add it. And so there's the data series. And then we're going to take A and divide it by B, except A is in billions of dollars. And B is, see, this one's billions of dollars. This one's in millions of dollars. And what I want to know is the percentage that we're spending above our income. And so to get an easy chart to read, I've got to take B uh, times 1,000 because 1,000 million is a billion. And then you apply that and you get a chart that reads, 1, 1. 1.2, 1. 1.8, and such. So when it's at 1, you're spending whatever your income is. It's a ratio of 1. 1. 1.1 is you're spending 10% more than your income, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and so on. And so you can look at how much we spend more than our income every single year, and it just goes up and up and up. And one of the things that you'll notice here is that we went through a big stock market boom in the 90s. You know, we had the crash of 87 and, and a recession and so on, of uh, recession of 1991, 92. Uh, and, uh, and then a big, huge stock market boom and GDP increased. And so there were more and more tax revenues. There wasn't a single year here where we cut spending. We always spent more than we did the previous year, but the economy and thus tax revenues was growing faster than what we were spending. And then we get to the year 2000 and there was a stock market crash and tax revenues start to fall. And then we have a recession and we have 9-11 and tax revenues continued to fall. GDP, however, didn't shrink that much uh, during this period of time, but tax revenues uh, fell. And so now we're spending basically 1.3 times, 1.29 times our income. And then we went through the real estate bubble and tax receipt, tax revenues increased and the GDP increased quicker than our government was spending us into a hole. But then we encountered the global financial crisis of 2000. You know, the, the stock markets started to roll over and started their crash. Real estate started going bad in 2007. So from 2007 to 2008, this in, the deficit increases, but then the global financial crisis hits. And if you look at the jump that happens here, that jump was caused mostly by tax revenues plummeting. And, you know, it's, it was tax revenues plummeting and uh, increased deficit spending at the same time. So the government is spending us into a hole. So it reached almost 75% more. It was 74% more than our income that we were spending. And then the economy started to grow. We started to get a little handle on it. And we went to spending just 23.5% more than our income. 
and then it started rising in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. So we started this crisis by already spending about 40% more than our income. Now, uh, you just saw that the uh, tax receipts, federal receipts, is like, uh, you know, 1.3, 1 point, I'm sorry, 3.4 trillion. But this is going to drop dramatically. GDP, taxes, everything is going to be dropping by a huge amount. Uh, like this is probably going to drop down into the $2 trillion range, $2.5 trillion uh, to $2 trillion. That range, it could even go lower. It depends on, on just how bad this thing gets. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the banking crisis. So this is going, it's going to be much bigger than the shrinkage of tax revenues that happened after the, the tech.com bubble popped and the, the global financial crisis of 2008. This is the greatest crisis in world history. I would look for this to drop by half, but probably down into the $2 trillion range, maybe even less, who knows. At the, in the meantime, they're, they're borrowing an extra $3 trillion. They're doing $3 trillion more of deficit spending. They're borrowing that much for just this quarter. So um, you, you take those two together, and you can expect this uh, chart of how much we spend beyond our income. This is going to go beyond, you know, this will go up past two, which means you're spending 100% more of your income. I wouldn't be surprised to see this go to even three or four. Uh, I mean, you know, if income drops down to two trillion dollars and they spend uh, six, eight, or ten, I mean, they're already at a level where they're spending five trillion dollars. And uh, if our tax revenues shrink to uh, two trillion, uh, that's a three trillion dollar deficit right there, and they're borrowing another three trillion. So there's six trillion trillion dollar deficit you know they're going to be spending on top of this five trillion they're going to be uh spending another three three trillion so that's eight and that was for this quarter we don't know what's going to happen the quarter after that now that means that the national debt is going to explode uh, these bonds that they issue are being issued at very low interest rates but those interest rates are constantly changing and all of these bonds roll over and they have to uh, issue new bonds. They pay off the old ones and they issue new bonds as they pay off the old ones. And that's the reason the debt is always increasing. The rollover used to be out about every four and a quarter years was the average between the short-term bonds and the long-term bonds. I don't know which bonds they're issuing, but when interest rates start to change, the interest on the national debt bringing you back to the, uh, the U.S. debt clock the interest on the national debt starts to go up and up and up. And uh, that is uh, in here. Uh, this starts going up and up and up. Um, and because as they roll over these bonds, the interest rate has to go higher. Now, if they keep interest rates low and create all this currency, eventually that will lead to inflation. As they create currency, first velocity is going to slow, just like in episode seven of Hidden Secrets of Money. It's going to slow and slow and slow. But then there will come a point where people have enough currency. You know, they'll do all these helicopter drops. They'll do modern monetary theory. They'll do whatever it takes. They're going to do these bailouts. But then they're going to get to a point where there's enough currency in the system to where people feel like they can spend some of it. And when that currency comes out of hiding, and velocity starts picking up, prices start going up. To control that, they have to raise interest rates. If they raise interest rates, they raise the cost of, doing, of running the government. And after a while, running the government becomes prohibitive. They, don't, they, they would have to create more currency to do that. But they're paying so much in interest. So they've painted themselves into a corner where I just don't see any end game to this. Uh, what I do see is that They'll probably hold interest rates low, and inflation will run rampant one day. And I, I don't see any uh, period in history where a government backed into this type of corner, and this is the worst example I've ever seen, but once a government starts to go into 
uh, inflation and the government costs start rising and rising and rising very quickly. The, the salaries of all the government employees, the collapse of uh, taxes, the deficit spending, when that starts rising very, very quickly, the choices that the government has is to shut off the printing presses, close the government, send all government employees home, nobody gets any checks from the government, and they wait and allow the free market to figure out how much currency is in the system, and prices will stop rising at that point. And then they could turn everything back on again. No government in history has ever made that choice. They have always printed their currency into oblivion. I just don't see a way out of this. Maybe you can figure out one for me. Put it in the comments below. I want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. The day of reckoning will come when millions of baby boomers reach the age where they have to take mandatory distributions from their IRAs. As they find that the investments they were counting on for their retirement, their homes and their IRAs full of mutual funds, have actually lost value, that the amount of stuff that they can buy from the proceeds if they sell their home is actually less than when they bought their home, and as they realize that their dream of a comfortable retirement was just that, a dream, all those boomers will get scared and pull in their horns. They will stop spending. They will start selling off their assets. And the greatest stock market crash in history will unfold as more and more boomers panic and sell. I believe this will also be accompanied by the greatest real estate crash the world has ever known. This perfect storm of bankruptcies and foreclosures will cause the currency supply to contract as the giant credit bubble pops and all those big spenders become big savers. When people save their currency, it stops circulating. The economic engine runs out of oil and the whole thing locks up. This is every central banker's worst nightmare. This is real deflation and the world's central bankers are about to discover the true scale of the horrors of a credit bubble implosion. When this happens, the Federal Reserve will once again send out its armada of money bomb dropping helicopters, but this time, something will be different. Something will have gone horribly wrong. The bombs will have been defused. The Fed will try pumping the banking sector by buying up every kind of debt they can get their hands on but to no avail. They will go to the extraordinary measures that they Harvard professor Shoshana Zuboff is sometimes called the Karl Marx of our time. Her monumental book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, exposed the dubious mechanism.